Welcome back to the program and thank you very much for staying with us on Daybreak on Trust TV. We're just getting things started. And as you can imagine, all eyes are on Nigeria's capital, Abuja, precisely at the appeals court as the presidential election petition tribunal is due to rule on whether or not President Tinubu should stay in as president after two rivals or more challenged his victory in the recently conducted presidential election uh, this year. There have been numerous legal challenges to the outcome of the previous uh, presidential elections, but none has succeeded. Most political observers expect the tribunal to uphold President Tinubu's win back in February. Atiku Abakar of the People's Democratic Party and the Labour Party's Peter Obi are asking the court to invalidate the victory, alleging irregularities and accusing the electoral umpire of breaching the law by failing to use electronic voting machines, or rather electronic machines like Beavers, to up upload uh, polling station results, among many other uh, legal arguments. Now, the tribunal, which will deliver its ruling in a matter of hours, has the power to cancel the election or other fresh one, perhaps. Uh, the, the outcomes are quite numerous at this point. Now, if it ho holds uh, President Tinubu's victory, Atiku Anubi can still go to the uh, Supreme Court to ask for more uh, from the uh, judiciary. However, this morning, as people await the judgment, we will be taking a look at the journey and the processes so far. And we have with us in the studio uh, experts, so to say, on this particular matter to help us unpack and navigate uh, through all the talking points as Nigerians await what promises to be a very uh, engaging day, to say the least. Joining us in the studio is uh, Mr. Sam Kagbo, he is a senior advocate of Nigeria, he is a constitutional lawyer also. And we also have joined us via Zoom, Dr. Sam Amadi, uh, who is uh, going to also add value to this conversation. Gentlemen, good morning to both of you and thank you very much uh, for joining us on Daybreak this morning. Thank you for having me. Right. Uh, if I could start with you, uh, Mr. Sam, give me your uh, personal take on the journey of the presidential election petition tribunal, what you make of it, and this is the climax, so to say. This is where it ends, uh, as far as uh, the election petition tribunal is concerned. I know that there is a likelihood that we're still going to see some more action at the Supreme Court, depending on how uh, the parties take today's ruling. Give me your thoughts on what you make of the whole thing. Well, the law had given the parties that participated in the election the right to challenge the result of the election. And uh, Section 134 give those who lost the right to challenge or question that particular declaration and return under three, for three reasons that the person who won was at the time of the election or qualified or that the election was mad by uh, irregularities or non-compliance mm. or non-compliance mm. and malpractices. And then thirdly, that the person who was declared a winner did not win by majority of lawful votes. Mm. That's what the law says. Mm. And uh, I think it was on the basis of that that the PDP and uh, the Labour Party, and I think some other parties... I think APM too, also APM is in the too, mix. ...went to the tribunal. And of course, our own uh, Jack Tiber law says who he who alleges must always proof. prove. So mm. it's a matter of uh, you set your threshold for yourself mm. by the allegations you make, and uh, you also have the owners or the responsibility to prove mm. those allegations. If you ca if you can if you can weigh the arguments, because I know you've, yeah. you've 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 been you know keeping up with some of these developments, yeah. the final uh, you know arguments that they made, both you know uh, you know during the session and the, their written arguments. What do you make of the quality of the argument vis-a-vis -vis what Nigeria, how difficult it will be for these justices to decide on, uh, on, on an outcome? Uh, I wouldn't, if, if you ask me mm. to give value to the uh, submissions, that would mean Mr. Congressman. But let me say this, uh, that is nothing difficult mm. for uh, the uh, tribunal, the Court of Appeal. Mm. Uh, I think much of this orchestration is by people who would always want things their own way. Mm. The law is very clear. If you have evidence and uh, you are able to table it before 
the Court of Appeal, actually not a tribunal in mm -hmm. this instance, definitely you would have your day. But if you do not have the evidence to read the threshold for you to get your victory, and no matter what you do, go ahead and poison the pond uh, like mm -hmm. some people have been doing. Mm -hmm. uh, they would not be bothered because of all the institutions, one of the most courageous and resilient institutions is the judiciary. They know that these things happen. They know that litigants are always up uh, with their own uh, orchestrations, mm -hmm. so they will not be moved. They will deliver judgment in accordance with the evidence before them and the law. And for any reason, each one of them there has his own tomorrow. And they know that there is also what and, uh, the Supreme Court there that would uh, also review their own judgment. So definitely, uh, I don't see them uh, pandering to any, uh, what would I call it, not sentiment or going outside the law. So it's not go going to the Supreme Court insulates them from feeling any pressure. Because they know that this might not be the, the last destination as far as the, as far as the uh, case is concerned. Yeah, you know the way our system works. Whatever you say is on record mm. for the rest of humanity. That's what I would say. Your judgment would be... Uh, referenced. Referenced tomorrow. And uh, your children's children would be there to come and read it. Uh, most of the time, those of them who sit in such vantage positions take account of that in making their own judgments. Mm. Uh, All right, let us bring mm. in uh, Dr. Sam Amadi at this point. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Thank you. It's good to see you again this good morning. morning. Thank you. All right. Uh, you, you've listened to some of the opening statements, if, 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 if that expression is correct, uh, by your learned colleague here. Um, uh, do you think some of the things we have seen outside of the court since the closing arguments over a month ago would exert any kind of pressure on the judges? He has said, well, they, they, they understand that there would always be a tomorrow and uh, whatever statements they make would be um, on record. But do, do you sense that there could be any kind of pressure at all? We've seen uh, this whole thing taken to a different level, bibos and all, urging uh, the courts to stand by the Constitution. What, what, what's your sense of the developments leading to this moment? Swayed, ought not, ought not. Uh, you see, that is an ideal of a judge. Uh, many years ago, I, I, I was a speaker at the Commonwealth Law Conference. I was looking at judicial corruption. And I made a point that there is a mythical idea of the judge as somebody who is different, peculiar, uh, not almost not human. But the reality is that judges are human. And as a teacher of jurisprudence, uh, we argue, fully the realist, that judges are also affected by both the culture, the norm, the behavior. The NJC has received several petitions of judges some of them confirmed, some of them not confirmed. So the story is clear that judges in Nigeria, as well as elsewhere, oftentimes can act uh, in response to improper motives. So let's not create the idea that law necessarily requires that we make judges to be mythical figures who are not influenced. They can be, but the training and the code requires them to do everything to stick to what the law says, what they understand. And let's be very clear about this. And that's why you have some cases in the Supreme Court here in Nigeria, elsewhere in the world, four or five. Five judges accept one position, four accept the other. Uh, we saw Buhari um, Yaradua. So Buhari, uh, I think Buhari Yaradua, yes. When Buhari almost won Prince Yaradua at the Supreme Court, it was actually, if I'm right, one difference of one, people like myself for them said that that election was nonsense. Of course, for you, just so for is the word shambolic. So it's a sham, not an election. So if seven judges or nine judges, one says three, if they are uh, seven, says one thing as four, says a different thing, or five, four, it means that the law is not as determinate as 
even some of the senior lawyers like my uh, this end others may conflict. So you're going to see judges take interpretations, perception of evidence, same evidence. They read it differently. Again, the build up to this case illustrate one thing. Every judiciary, judiciary is an institution, uh, and I have it on authority of uh, the leading contemporary 21st century political scientist, Robert Dow, who says the Supreme Court, and in this case, courts, are political institutions. Why are they political? So they, because they determine the major political questions of the day. The election of a president is the most important political question. And like it or leave it, it is the court that will ultimately decide it in our tradition. As we are, uh, the electoral management system is very credible, reliable, and transparent. So nobody second guesses votes, except in rare cases, like in 2000 in, um, in Florida. I was a graduate student at Harvard when this happened, where only dispute around whether a few ballot papers that looked the way they were voted, child, called them child votes, child ballot, whether actually the intention of the voter was A or B. And the Secretary of State, Catherine Harris, said it was A, and the Democratic Party felt, well, he's a Republican, actually. She's a Republican. And they went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court had to decide quickly before the D-Day to say she had the powers to make that finding. They reverted back to her. Right. And that's how I go. Bush because so so the answer to that question is simple. This build up shows the heightened nature of this election. Who stakes for the first time we are seeing it's not really the regulator of judicial integrity. It shows that the people the judicial work itself is part of a political work, but done differently, which focus on the law and the evidence. So we could we should expect that the judges would like to do what they ought to do, but at the same time, they are going to keep an eye on the quality in terms of, for example, the transparency of saying we're going to do brokers or other measures to safeguard. Again, judicial workers have asked to stay at home. Why? Because they understand that there's heightened tension. But that does not mean they will now pander to anybody's sentiment. Right. It okay. simply means that okay. they are going to be more focused. Uh, Dr. Amadi, uh, clearly also, uh, let's not forget that uh, there, there is a nationwide strike action right now that is uh, still ongoing, uh, which I suppose will also hinder some of those workers to be uh, working today. But Absolutely. then again, uh, back to the issue of, of the judgment today. Uh, there are a lot of people uh, mm -hmm. who share this uh, opinion that whoever wins, Nigeria loses, or in this case, whoever wins, the judiciary loses, because even before... Uh, we got to this point. There are already a lot of people um, that have been accusing uh, members of the APC or the APC-led administration of, of course, even writing the judgment. I mean, we've heard several accusations like that. We saw the billboards. And also, just as you said, uh, you know, at one point in time, we came this close uh, to overturning a presidential election, especially after the 2007, I beg your pardon, uh, shambolic elections, where I think the entire world agreed that that was uh, way, way below standard as far as uh, credibility of the election is concerned. Give me your take on how unprecedented this moment could be, especially if you look at what is at stake, the arguments that are being made, plus the pressure that is being mounted on them. I know in 2007 there was a lot of pressure, but this is the day and age where social media has given access to a lot of people. And for the first time, I dare say, we're going to have a televised uh, broadcast of, uh, of of the judgment itself. How how high are the stakes, and 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 do you think that uh, these justices can rise up to the occasion? Very good question. I think really my heart goes to the judges themselves. I mean, they didn't begin to be this exposed to all these uh, crises attacks. I, I agree. There are so many very terrible things being said, being done against them, or meritedly. I've even listened to uh, Justice, former Justice, um, uh, what's her name, uh, Mayor Adelaide's uh, statement, even though he was maybe not prudent enough in the context, but not really to warrant the level of attack. So they, 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 this is a unique election. You're right. We didn't have this level of social media uh, activity when Buhari challenged Yara Dua. And again, we didn't even monitor the issues much. We woke up and had the judgment and we went home. But this is one election where, first, 
before the election, there was so much activity around the profile, the names, the issues around corruption. We never had this big. We have a president today who is struggling with too many allegations, not proven, but allegations, nevertheless, waiting of criminality, even of corruption. So this election has basically upturned our idea of uh, election petition, which is basically some smart lawyers ding donging in court, and the end of the day, that's a party. But now we are seeing a movement itself reporting cases, reporting procedures, sometimes slanting them, sometimes, you know, making them look ridiculous, sometimes going out of the cuff to uh, fight judges. So this is a unique case. Anyhow, it comes down, whether uh, Tinubu wins or either of the, of the, of the uh, petitioners win today. Judiciary will suffer. The, the commentary afterwards will be one of either corruption, being brought over, or one of cowardice in, in Kotogu to uh, uh, the naysayers to obedience. Or, so, either way. And again, what I think judges should be doing now, and senior lawyers like my colleague in the, in the studio, is to think about the Monday after. How do we repair the image of the courts or the image of the judiciary? after this violence. Either way, how do we ensure that first, we do not insert the courts too dramatic into election election matter? And if we, and INEC does the job well, I mean, let's forget about a legal argument. If we do everything right, like we had in 2015, you know, far better, you reduce the chance of all this crisis. I've argued since 2019 that INEC is a regulator, just like you have in the US. For example, issues about technical qualification. If before you file election in America, you file a, a petition, the regulator verifies, receives comments, and then approves you. So it, it, we shouldn't be talking about, oh, uh, APM has a case that says uh, 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 Shetima got uh, nominated 21 days after uh, somebody withdrew. And the argument is very simple. They are saying that the law says 12 to 14 days. So if INEC had first determined that, maybe we won't be here. Again, the issue of 25%, which INEC has a right as a regulator, the U.S. Supreme Court in Chevron case made it clear. I think it's the first person who should interpret the law. I think it should have come out through a due process rulemaking and say, this is our understanding. Osama about what is the issue. I think should have determined that, look, based on all this, we're going to take 25 to be X, not Abuja. If they've done that, people would have accepted it before Tinubu. So when Tinubu won, and people are saying, oh, you didn't get Abuja, there was lack of clarity. So I think the lesson here is okay. that... We shouldn't allow the court to be overburdened. The court is now going to carry be the crime baby. It's, no matter what happens, it's not, it's not good for judiciary. Mm -hmm. Judges shouldn't be under this kind of pressure. Judges should be persons who do their job in secret and do it privately and do it according to law. If you don't like it, go to Supreme Court. After Supreme Court, everybody should accept the outcome. So my appeal is that no matter what happens, let's get back to restore that level of insulation for the cuts from mm. this dispute right. and strengthening them to do their job. That's right. very Prof. important. Okay, coming back to the Leonard Sick uh, in the studio, he talks about the Monday after. Of course, and, uh, <laughs> that is always <laughs> the Monday. Uh, yeah, but, and uh, most of some uh, of, of these accusations around this attempt to ridicule or pressure uh, the judges, it's, it's not just a creation of the media, it's actually a creation of practitioners uh, within uh, that 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 realm because mm. unfortunately, unfortunately. 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 unfortunately from the bar yeah. itself yes. you, mm. you know yeah. and so one begins to wonder because you listen to one lawyer you get a, a yeah, sense of, of this, something yeah. and yeah. then you're talking to the next person he makes a, a nonsense mm. of of whatever the other person has said yeah. and, and sometimes you begin to wonder whether this English they speak is mm. any different from the one from you learned uh, <laughs> you learned in the university it should be the same <laughs> yourself because you are looking at the scenario and you think this is pretty straightforward and you just need to listen to one of them for 30 seconds and you completely uh, uh, get a different sense of what's happening. It, how, how important is it that we have this Monday after uh, at the back of our mind when, when all of this? You, you see, every lawyer should actually know that, yes, he is a social commentator, but most importantly, as a lawyer, you know, uh, thankfully, Amadi and I uh, were on the same editorial board in 2007 when the election was on. We all knew what went 
uh, on mm -hmm. to the point that even the candidate himself accepted yeah, that the guy in this process was flawed, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, but over time, I think there have been some improvements, mm -hmm. and, uh, and nobody would uh, compare the two to mm -hmm. say they are the same. Mm -hmm. They are not the same. But let me get to the point. You see, election petitions, uh, to me, uh, more or less like mathematical sort of measurements, mm -hmm. in the sense that if you are involved in election petitions and uh, you actually know what the law is, you can look at the petition and say, oh, this is dead on arrival. Mm -hmm because you know what the law says. You understand? The uh, law is not as critical and as expansive and as confusing as the practitioners have made it, because most of the time, some of us, we try to pander to the public. Mm -hmm. If you ask me for my private thought, I can uh, talk from here to tomorrow, but if you are asking me about election petitions and uh, you are asking me to predict outcomes, I could simply go to the law. The law is simple. When is a candidate disqualified? When is he not qualified? When is uh, the winner who has been declared uh, not having the majority of lawful votes? What is the threshold? What is the evidence that you need to adduce at the tribunal for you to prove that all of these things are in the books. Yeah, but, Simple. Yeah, but, 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 but most but, of the time, mm, our mm, colleagues mm. are not pra election petition practitioners. Mm, mm. That's what it should. Yeah, but most but, of the time, most of them that you see talking so much, I know some big men among them that even when they filed their own petition, it was crushed on the, on, on the ground of incompetence. Right. You understand? Because they do not take that time to look at what the Electoral Act and the decisions have been made over time on those provisions. They don't. They would rather think that this is about what? Uh, civil uh, uh, hearings or criminal trials and all of that. They bring the same principles, the same set mind. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, like I said, the tribunal or the court of appeal for this time around they shouldn't have any problem at all right. the issue of tomorrow is a perception thing mind you i have always said it here most of us our perception of what is good it is what is good for me what is good for me is good for the world mm -hmm. what is not good for me is not good for the world we right. always look at things from our own point of view yeah and but, but that and, is and, to me I, I, the problem. I know some of your colleagues in the bar yeah. would, would not uh, take it kindly with you, you know. No <laughs> apology. Least, yeah. With no yeah. apology. Yeah. But, I, I but, but, but no also, apology. But also yes. Yes. away from just interpretation, right? Yeah. Uh, you talk about how the law is in black and white. Simple. I do know that the, the law, you know, is an ass and it's always a work in progress, right? But there is also this sense that when, just as uh, Sunday alluded to earlier, when one um, lawyer explains the situation, you kind of go, oh, he's right. And then the next one counts to the argument and say, okay, perhaps he, has, he also has a point. Especially around something so basic as the, the status of the FCT, for instance, right? We do have it in the Constitution. Yes, it's and, a simple and, and thing. You think it's open and shut? There's no ambiguity uh, around that? Not at all. Because the Constitution will never really, I've said it here, mm. it will never leave you to uh, make a determination. You think it's not it. ambiguous? Like at all, the at all, at all, at all, at all, at all, it's not, it's not. Whoever wants to give it ambiguity, good luck to the person. Mm. And in any case, judgment is just hours away. Mm. That uh, 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 problem or that, mm. that issue would be Literally. put to rest. But uh, let me say it here, from my own experience, I, I, I was involved in 12 uh, petitions. Mm. I've had judgments in seven. Not one single one of them did I call a witness. Mm. I look at your case, mm. look at you, the evidence you put, I say, oh, you have no case. I have no mm. call, uh, no, mm. no call. I will only rely on what? My cross-examination. Mm. And all, I've had four judgments mm. in my favor. Mm. You understand? Mm. Because the law is so simple. You cannot after making your own petition, you go about town looking for evidence. Oh no, that evidence will not matter. And in any case, the time they had to actually look for evidence and make their case concrete, most of them were all over the media, grandstanding 
and most of them, like I said, poisoning the pond, mm. instead of working hard, mm. making a very good pot, uh, petition. Okay. In 2011, mm. I was able to nullify mm. a governorship election in Kebi. I was not a senior advocate then, mm. but I had learned mm. from the big uh, men in the profession. I have been with uh, Chief Ola mm. I have been with whosoever that is mm. out there that you call what? Mm. An expert in the case. And I have learned the ropes. And that is why when I come to sit up by election, I'm very cautious. Mm. I don't want to go beyond the point or give people the false hope that, mm. oh, this would happen. Oh, no. If, if you have your evidence mm. for election petitions, you would have your day. Of mm. course, there is the issue of corruption and here and there. Uh, it happens. But first and foremost, do your job. Do your job. Mm. Okay. okay. Get so your evidence. For some of us mm. keen watchers of development uh, around the election petition, not necessarily this one, but mm. from, from previous years, if things are as simple as I, I get the sense from what you're saying, what do you think then is the motivation for having this whole uh, 180 days show of banter, counter banter, and whipping up public sentiments? Do you think there is, there is some motive other than just getting a victory from there? Is, is there a way of sustaining um, your likability or, or whatever it is, or creating a sense of I've been cheated out of this process. Uh, <laughs> so you guys saw how everything yeah, went. Yeah. I couldn't stand the I law. Don't. Let's just wait for the next election where we could we could do better and avoid being cheated out. Of that. What, what, what do you think is, is the grand motivation for all of us? Psychological warfare mm. is part of it. And sometimes too, our colleagues like to be seen to be on the side of the people. Mm. And uh, all of us benefited from it anyway, because if they had not orchestrated what they did after the election, we couldn't have had that many <laughs> election petitions. Mm -hmm. In 2014, mm -hmm. uh, when uh, 15, when Jonathan lost and he said, oh, thank you, mm -hmm. <laughs> I concede, mm -hmm. we didn't have too many election petitions, mm -hmm. and some of us didn't benefit from it. Mm -hmm. But this time around, everybody wanted to go This to is good for business, isn't it? <laughs> too bad. <laughs> you know, too bad. <laughs> Talking seriously, right. Right. Uh, let's, let's, let's don't go this route of trying to destroy the only institution that I know as of today mm. Out of the three of them, that is the best we have. Mm. And that's the only institution that I think is really working 24 hours a day. Right. Agreed, you have some elements among them that uh, are dishonorable, but they have not shied away from it. The NGC has, over time, be shipping them and weeding them out of the system. No other uh, organ is doing that. That issue of what self cleansing, mm. no other uh, uh, arm of government mm. care to try to actually do what they call a peer review mm. and peer assessment. They don't care. If you are not caught, you are with mm. us. It is mm. only when you are caught that they say, oh, too bad. Mm. You understand? But this. Uh, arm of government is nearer to the people and in terms of integrity if a mm. question is to be put on it mm. they are better than the two oh, so i okay. don't want us to go to this way of trying to shame them trying to put them in a bad light trying to intimidate them and all of that yeah. they are doing a very great job mm. okay. my brother if you have an idea of what it is to hear a case, a right a judgment, mm. you would pitch it as people. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I mean, now might not necessarily be the time to sell uh, sympathy for, for, for the judges, for Nigerians, <laughs> because they don't believe that actually, uh, you know, the judges deserve some sort of sympathy. I mean, they're just doing their jobs. But I understand that, that uh, the difficulty around that. Let's bring, in back, uh, bring back in uh, Dr. Uh, Amadi uh, for a minute now. 
I, I just want to get your sense of what necessarily pushed us to this point. For most people, we wouldn't be here if INEC had done a great job, a good job, a more effective one with the presidential election uh, this time around, especially around the use of beavers, electronic uh, transmission of results on the IREV and things like that. Uh, there are so many other questions. Even the, uh, the, 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 the routine check on candidates' qualification, for instance, as you stated earlier, that it is their job to, to help you know, ascertain whether the, the, the validity of your qualifications and the ones that you've sent to the commission itself. Uh, if it had done that, maybe it wouldn't even be part of uh, the case uh, this time around. But give me a sense of how this pits INEC against other political parties, because any case INEC makes against uh, you know, APC against PDP, I beg your pardon, and the Labour Party and APM counts uh, in favor of uh, the APC because now INEC has to defend the credibility of the election, which in a way is doing 50% of the job uh, for the APC and President Tunubu because he's also uh, going to benefit if INEC succeeds in convincing uh, the tribunal that the election was free and fair, even though, uh, you know, President Tinbo has the lowest margins uh, as far as uh, the electoral victory is concerned. Give me a sense of how complicated this whole thing is, where INEC has to come to the defense of one of the parties involved. It is a neutral party, but then again, now it has a dog in the fight to protect the integrity and the credibility of the election. So INEC does have a side, and now, right now, it does appear that it has to take the side of the APC. As far as the, the outlook of the case is concerned. But very good. Uh, first, uh, the electoral act and uh, electoral uh, petition procedure is very clear. So when you sue, you are also suing INEC for declaration that is false, undue declaration. Uh, and the law is very clear how who can petition and what you can, the ground can be. The ground can be that you ought to be declared the winner because you won uh, of lawful votes or because of no compliance with the electoral act, or because the election, you know, um, ought not to have, or the, somebody is not even qualified to run for the election, which I like allowed. So I like becomes a party. But then the question is, how should I like conduct itself? I like conduct should be basically to show that it did its job, it followed the law in acting as a regulator. And by the way, I've always said this, and uh, oftentimes Nigerian lawyers should admit that Nigerian jurisprudence of election uh, regulation is underdeveloped. You read judgments, you read Nigerian senior lawyers, they, they don't accept that we have deficient education in administrative regulation. Because regulation is just coming new. I teach that, I studied it at some of the best places in the world, but I can tell you, great judgment, you see that even an like, institution is struggling to understand. I give you one simple example. When Obama defeated Clinton in the Democratic primary, Clinton at the convention, before it was confirmed, Clinton's lawyers filed a petition. The party had to do adjudicatory hearing, adjudicative adjudication. The party has to sit to go through that petition openly and uphold the procedure in which they used to defeat to win um, uh, 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 Clinton. That is what administrative adjudication. INEC is not a, trans a transition manager. The commission is commissioners at the INEC. Every procedure should be on record. Two principles we uphold in administrative law. We call it that the policies are not capricious and basically discretionary. That means it's made on reason, on record, and under due process, substantive and procedural due process. So what am I saying? In 2019, when uh, Atiku lost, Olu Stachidoka, his lawyer, his uh, attorney officer, or his rep at the collection center, levied allegations against votes. What Alex should do, and what the Electoral Act says now, is that Alex should pause, do a hearing, Give us a petition, give for two hours, produce a petition, they listen to it, and they make a decision on record. So when you go to tribunal, the tribunal will simply look at INEX exercise of discretion and say it's reasonable, it's logical, it's legal, approve it. So INEX failure 
to carry this due diligence procedure is part of why cases go up. Look at what happened in River State, for example, a piece of evidence where it is now both the BBC, Premium Times, even the INEC itself now admits that the person who did the return is not an INEC staff. And votes are now out to show that there were actually real mutilation. Whether it could upset the result is a different matter. It may not, even if you add it, change the outcome. But it tells, it tells you a story about Bungood procedure. So I have always said that the parties didn't rig the election. INEC rigged the election by failure to follow procedures. Let's take, for example, the debate around electronic voting. How did it arise? In previous elections, the Supreme Court has even said that, look, in many cases where people use card readers, because if the card reader is not binding, manual, manual uh, application is okay. Result of our voting, we could not determine. We now argued and fought. I was part of the committee that worked for INEC, and I chaired a subcommittee for the electoral reform. And the idea was, Let's have accuracy of counting. So we now say, okay, we know that the error happens between voting and counting and taking them to so-called collection center where along the way this can happen, uh, 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 cancellation, or, or, or changing the number, and all kinds of things. So the law says, or actually the act now authorized and to make a choice, and it made a choice, and made a regulation portion to the constitution, especially says so and the act, that says we will now Okay. from after counting and signing, right. transmit. So the okay. point I'm making is that clearly that things should have been done that will create this crisis. Final point I want to make on this, uh, and I, 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 I disagree slightly with uh, the learned essay, and I mean, right. he is an authority on election matters. Right. Right. right, okay. Uh, Dr. Amadi, if, if, you can, if, you can just, if you can just hang on for, for a moment, uh, because uh, we, we do have uh, Sagira Ibrahim, uh, who is at the court right now, to uh, give us some sort of update on uh, how things are shaping up uh, right now at the appeal court as Nigerians await what promises to be a very uh, dramatic day, to say the least. Uh, Sagira, good morning. Um, how are things shaping up over there? Good morning, Abdullah. Quite an interesting morning it is here around um, the Court of Appeal, which is the venue of the Presidential Electoral Election uh, Petitions Tribunal. And it's expected today that judgment would be delivered in the cases filed uh, by different uh, parties, including the Allied Progressive Movement, uh, the Labour Party, as well as the PDP and its candidate, Al Haji Atiku uh, Abu Bakr. So far, the proceedings is yet to comment. However, we've noticed the presence of heavy security, um, especially by the Nigerian Police Force, the Department of State Services, as well as the Nigerian Army. Now, if you would walk with me, you would see uh, that around this side, there's been sort of a pro-solidarity rally, or if you would call it um, a demonstration, uh, by some Niger Delta indigents in support of President Silvu ahead of uh, the tribunal sharing. And just right behind me is a barricade of the Nigeria police and other security agencies, you know, before uh, the, the, the commencement of, of the, the proceedings and also to ensure that security is beefed up, you know, during the, the proceedings and to ensure that there is no breakdown um, of law and order. Back to you in the studio. Yeah, yeah uh, Sagir, just before you go, uh, if you can just give us a sense of what the atmosphere is like. Do you get the sense that peop the people around that uh, vicinity, I mean, we did hear from the, uh, the, the, the I, I believe, uh, the register of the court that uh, as far as uh, the arrangement for persons attending the hearing or gaining access into the courtroom is concerned, they would have to be accredited. I mean, uh, the media as well as the council and representatives of political party. But outside the court, just give us a sense of what that, those protests or march or demonstrations are, are telling you about how charged the atmosphere is. Well, the, the atmosphere is charged with positive energy, I must, I must say that, because um, it's been really a calm atmosphere here. Um, but, but with regards to accreditation, it's been a tedious process, I must say, because um, some correspondents and members who wanted to partake in the court proceedings had to wait until 
somewhat around 11 p.m. last night to get their accreditation. So accreditation into the premises has been a bit hectic. And up until this moment, I can say categorically um, that people are still finding it difficult to access the, the premises. But the good thing, however, is that uh, the proceedings is yet uh, to comment. And just to give you sort of a filler, um, the APM is challenging the elections um, on the ground that the Vice President, Kati Shetima, had double nominations and as senator and also as vice president and also for the Labour Party and its candidate Peter Obi, they are insisting that uh, the election was rigged in favour of Tinubu and Kashim Shetima, who is the president and the vice president. And also they claim that he did not score uh, the 25% of vote cast spread across 24 states of the country and the FCC, which has been a contention, you know, in their case. And finally, for the People's Democratic Party and its candidate, Atiku Abu uh, they are calling on the tribunal to annul the election or declare uh, Atiku Abu the former vice president Atiku Abu Bakr, as uh -huh. the winner of the February 26th uh, presidential election on the ground that the current president, um, Ashwa Dibola Ahmed Tinubu, was not qualified as at the time that he contested Okay. The election. Okay. Uh, Sagir, thank you for the update. Uh, it's going to be a long day for, for all of us <laughs> here at Trust TV covering this uh, particular de development. So thank you very much for uh, the situation report. Uh, <laughs> SAN, give us, give us your take. I mean, we saw those demonstrations and, you know, I, I don't know how I feel about it. So I just, I just want to get your take on, you know, we, we did talk about playing to the gallery, uh, sensationalizing this uh, particular issue where Nigerians are overly invested in it to a point where you get the sense that it is going to further polarize not just viewpoints, but people's minds about the integrity of the judiciary itself. You saw some of those uh, demonstrators at the ground. <coughs> what does that tell you? Well, a bad story. Huh. Uh, but uh, like I would always say, it's anticipated. It is not something out of the blues. It's part of our own life. And like I would say, the judiciary would always anticipate this. And uh, for some of them, when you ask them, say, unlike you, I don't even read the newspaper, I don't watch television, so I'm not under pressure. Whatever you people say there, it is even what you come to tell me, say, and that's why most of the time they avoid the public because they don't want to be what? To Influenced by yeah, it. Well, as a petitioner, SAN, have, yeah. you, have, have you counted on, on things like this to support your case? In the you, past, they are not part of the evidence. You mm. see, <laughs> the law yeah, but, is. The but law I mean, is there, about there is the court. Admissible <laughs> evidence. Yeah, well, as, as yeah. there is the court, mm -hmm. right? Court of, as, as, as far as our judiciary is concerned, as yes. an institution, and, and the then there is a court of public, public opinion. opinion. Yes, and you want to win in both, if 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 possible, isn't it? For now, I would want to win at the tribunal. <laughs> right, <laughs> that's my right. Uh, right. Uh, business for now. Mm. Uh, I concern myself with the tribunal. Mm. Most of the time, when I have people uh, come and try to grandstand, mm. I wait for you to finish. I said, I have a vehicle to catch or mm. a flight to catch. Please. Mm. I would take just five, ten minutes, and mm -hmm. I'm done. Because what, like I'm insisting, the law is straightforward. But let's come back to certain things that uh, Doc said. Yes, ideally, we should all try to accede to those standards. But INEC cannot play any magisterial role. Mm. It cannot, because the law forbids that. Mm. Uh, most of the time, People would expect INEC to do that which the law says you cannot do. No. You can't make any binding decision. There is no decision that INEC would make that you bring to the tribunal as evidence. No. It's I mean, even when it comes to vetting a candidate, for instance? It cannot. It cannot because, you see, they've tried it at one point and the, the courts struck those decisions down to say, oh, no, you cannot do it. Receive. The fight is not yours. Any it's party who has any grievance against anything that a party has, but that's why we have pre-election matters. The pre-election matters are uh, meant to give the parties or candidates the opportunity to challenge uh, uh, the papers and the qualification disposition of the candidates. That's what the loss is. The moment you have uh, INEC, publishing the candidates and each candidate is supposed to put in is from EC9, mm. you know, wherein he states that he is qualified and he attached to it an affidavit, mm. you know, deposing to the fact that 
he is qualified. INEC is only what? Obligated to receive that and not to make judgment on it. Mm. I have gone. You as don't far think that that is flawed? That is the law. It's not for mm. an INEC. It's mm. the law that is uh, the problem is. here, mm. not mm. INEC. Mm. I have gone up to the Supreme Court to say that if you do not present certificate, you only have an affidavit then you are not qualified because qualification is a fundamental issue. It's not something you leave for guesswork. You cannot just depose to an affidavit and say you are qualified without any paper or any form of evidence, you know, to support that qualification. The Supreme Court said no. The case of Kaki and PDP. Mm. The Supreme Court said no. The moment he says he is qualified and uh, he has deposed to an affidavit, if you say he is not qualified, that's your problem. Prove it. And that's what it is that case that what Buhari relied on mm. in 2019, uh, uh, 2015 mm. to say, oh, I have put in my affidavit and my affidavit has said I have qualified. Mm. I mean, and if can, you it, say it, it, I'm it, it, not qualified, mm. it's, it's not the onus on you mm. to mm. prove how I mean, I'm not qualified. I mean, that case came that, back in 2019 also. Yes. Mm. That was my case. I was mm. the only person mm. before then who went to the Supreme Court mm. to challenge that. Mm. All right. But uh, mm. the Supreme Court has held. Mm -hmm. what, can, what can we do? Mm. Okay. All right. Bring it on, Dr. Amadi. Prof, um, you, you talked about how you've been part of... Uh, some of these previous cases in the past and, and, and reviews by INEC. How much have um, some of these arguments, especially at the presidential tribunal, helped to shape our preparations for subsequent elections? What did we learn in the first one, you know, that we built into our electoral reforms? And how have we graduated this learning to the level where we can begin to talk about a future where we can minimize the basis for approaching uh, uh, the tribunals, because as, as he has argued, uh, it, it would, uh, as much as some of the things he said are desirable, I cannot be seen to be educating on any matter. How do we begin to strengthen our, uh, our electoral laws, you know, to, to take care of these things and, and be as prescriptive as possible so that you know what, you know, A is A, B is B, there are no rooms for contention, and so we don't waste the time of it. Because in a way, uh, this may be about the law, but it's also about governance. Because at the end of the day, if your legitimacy is challenged, uh, it, it, it sort of beclouds your, your concentration and, and even some of the reforms that you, you need to, to, to carry on. Because on the one hand, it looks like I'm not here yet. I am not fully on ground. I, I can't begin to take on certain reforms that would, that would uh, drive public sentiment against me. And in a way. So, just help us make a sense of how we have learned from the past and how we, that can that help us improve our process going forward. Thank you very much. I think we have learned. And again, let me make this point. I said that if Nigeria excludes good lawyers responsible, sin advocates and judges sometimes, <laughs> I don't understand what they're saying. And I want to be frontal. Maybe you've already a new electoral act. The act now allows INE to make those determination and the again mistake they make lawyers keep making this mistake i practice with kind of for me about this about but i'm not just an academic not just a policy person a determination just like a uh, 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 body does it's not final the act says so the law says so the court's job is to review what you have done the reason we have INE is to first do it he's correct the previous law Foolishly, foolishly, and against all principles of administrative law. I can say that as an authority on administrative law. Every administrative law allows adjudicatory regulators to make findings of fact and law. They have the right to do that. That's what they call the quasi judicial. For example, you go to uh, get a license from a federal representative commission. You say, I'm um, qualified and they see you at 13 years would they give you the license no not giving you it's a judicial quasi judicial finding they have said you're not entitled to have a license you can go to court and challenge it housing permits these are everyday things so INEC now has that 
authority to make that finding, which is subject to judicial. How can you say A is qualified, B is, when an X says submit your parties and your official credential, what's that like looking for? To just be a custody, we house it. So if somebody didn't bring a certificate, okay, it's not okay. When you bring uh, affidavit or bring, yes, they're all evidence that you have co computer school. That's number one. Number two, the law has changed before. The court says, the law says, elections as primary elections don't have to be democratic. This new act says nobody, it excluded all so called statutory delegates, party officials. It says every delegate to electing convention, convention must be democratically elected. I was the first person in this country who alerted INEC. INEC didn't know, parties didn't know. I, I was to PDP people, and I told them, I said, you can't vote as a delegate anymore because what we wanted to fight all the way from was we have few people control the party now, you have to win in a primary, and that's why the case of uh, 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 senior president, former and president, became controversial because the wreck is said the same law says you have to send observers and they have to give you a report. Now, the job they go there is to observe whether it's actually happened the way it's prescribed. So, our next job is when the reporters come back, they said that primary was won by Mr. A. So, if the party now feels Mr. B instead of Mr. A, the lawyers and self advocates are telling us that the INEC should do nothing, build it in, and allow victims run the cost of going to Supreme Court, very expensive cost, to just do what INEC ought to do. So, the premise is very clear. This new Electoral Act gives rightly an power to make a finding of fact as a regulator, if never final. It's the court who has the powers to finalize, if you can. But the point I make is that if people, if INEC does the job well, few people will know that going to court will be a waste of time because they have done the job well and likely lose. Okay. Uh, and it's easier for the court. Look at the case. No, I'm talking about, look at the case of Adeleke, for example, the last one, and the previous one. It was this innovation in the new electoral act that the Supreme Court now you have to now get this so-called, what they call uh, this report on the beavers. In the past, the same law says, if beavers don't work, you will not vote. Those are innovation. Now, there are some things we have to clarify in this act as we see this proceeding. Mm -hmm. One of the questions we have to determine is that, should INEC be in a position to refuse to provide electoral, electoral results, copies of it, to okay. litigants? Okay. Shouldn't the court compare, apart from the order, what should be done to INEC? Shouldn't you enter judgment against an INEC that okay. does election right. and refuses to turn in the instrument of election for the person who wants to challenge it? And people are saying, rely on your agent. There's no requirement that the agent, suppose you don't have money to have agents. They are saying, therefore, that the voters... Okay. Uh, uh, right. I, I think we're, 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 we're segueing into uh, a That's complete uh, overview of, of, the, of the elections, but we, we, we really do want to, you know, just stick to uh, the uh, presidential election petition. I, mean, I know that the, perhaps uh, the points you're making are definitely tied to that because it is also a part of, of, of the conversation. But you did we, we make one Absolutely. particular point around how members of the bar are part of the problem. And I saw uh, SA uh, not his head or shake his head uh, in disagreement or whatever. Uh, he did uh, point out how the new Electoral Act itself is very clear about what INA can or cannot do, especially on the issue of qualification. You appear to, to differ uh, in, in this regard. What, what is your understanding or interpretation of the electoral I, act of I've made my point <laughs> with, with mm. due respect mm. to uh, Prof. Mm. Uh, INEC cannot determine an issue of qualification. Mm. It cannot. That is the business of the court. You know, uh, it's good to say, yes, I've done this, I've done that. I was also part of uh, the committee on the white paper for waste report. I represented the minister of the FCT then mm. throughout. So I know some of these problems from the base route because you bring in experts, they educate you on this thing before you make your recommendations to government. And I have seen it in practice in and out. Yeah, INEC has some discretionary powers during or before, mm. during and after the election. Uh, but to say INEC can vet qualifications. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, much of the uh, cases in courts now <coughs> or 
on qualifications are uh, based on what what the candidates themselves presented mm -hmm. some people will say oh you did not even sign your affidavit you did not attach forms and all of that and the argument has always been oh you ought to have done that ventilated that before the election that's a pre-election matter and all of that but that's on the merit and uh, of the cases but coming to the issue of INEC I think let's leave INEC to its administrative functions if we go ahead and give INEC any magisterial powers then it will be bogged down with litigation because for whatever decision it takes if it does not uh, favor a party, it would go to court. And in any case, like I said, even if INEX is from here to tomorrow and makes the best of judgment, you cannot rely on that to make a case at the tribunal. Mm -hmm. No, because uh, the best it can be is an opinion. Mm -hmm. And the court would say, I'm uh, very vast in this particular issue. I don't need anybody's opinion and uh, I don't need anybody's hand. Mm -hmm. I can deal with it. You know, many of us have tried to bring in some expert, expert analyst, expert this one. The court will look at it and say, oh no, those that we want, to come and testify to us and give credence or damnify an election are those who are agents of political mm. parties or those who voted or the candidates themselves well, we who always, participated. Well, we also, those are the witnesses that the tribunals the want to, to the, listen uh, to, mm. not <clears throat> other experts or other bodies. No, you cannot bring in a determination by INEC, you say you want to come and uh, uh, use that to persuade the court for anything. It's, we haven't gotten to that standard yet. Mm. Yes, it could be a very good uh, try, but mm. we've not gotten there. The law has not looked at it that mm. way. As for now, you put in your papers, as long as the political party, that responsibility for me mm. should even be that of the political party. Mm -hmm. Let the political parties know the consequence of putting in a disqualified candidate like what happened in Bielsa. Mm -hmm. If you do and the court finds that the person is not qualified, you lose the seat. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. Let the political party do that. But you know the way uh, uh, politics is being canvassed within the political parties. Yes, the Electoral Act has uh, prescribed some, uh, some form of what? Uh, mm. Democracy in party politics. But how much of that do you see in their primaries? Yeah. Except perhaps okay. the presidential mm. uh, election listen, primary. A lot of people watching the program and hearing this conversation right now would say, listen, at the end of the day, even if the justices see it in black and white, it is unprecedented in this country. And I don't know of a, of, of a country where the presidential election was upturned, but it is frankly impossible for, for this to happen. Do you think that if they actually see something in the laws, in the arguments made by the various petitioners, that something of this nature is even likely going to happen in this country? It should, but you see, the Electoral Act in itself has made it near impossible because okay. for you to prove malpractices, it has to be a poly unit by poly unit sort of aggregation. Mm. It is not about people's view. Even if you were in the field mm. and you have actually gone to the field and recorded all of this, the first hurdle you have is for you to put in that video evidence and all of that, you know, as part of the evidence. And they still ask you. And uh, perhaps the court could mm. still just put it aside and say, yes, I look at it, but I would want to listen to the people. Okay. And uh, if okay. you have over uh, 700,000 poly units, mm. and you have complaints from each of those poly units. The law would not say because you have an aggregate of about 50, they would not say that is what a preponderance. No, mm. uh, the law would say you have to cut the threshold because what are they saying? If you prove my practices, that's one hurdle. You now have to prove that the malpractice is substantial. And when you are done with that, there's the third leg, okay. which is to say it has substantial 
potentially affected, affected the outcome. outcome of the election. Right. Okay. Interesting. Uh, I wish uh, we can continue to take this uh, when you have a learner sick in the <laughs> studio. Uh, the professor of law, <laughs> and then there's so much uh, you can stretch between mm. this conversation for the education of Nigerians and um, for a better understanding of how these processes work and what could determine outcomes, uh, so that we measure our expectations generally mm. and, and, and don't go destroying mm. society mm. over pronouncement. Um, this is where we'll take a short break uh, to bring you a newspaper review. I want to thank. Uh, the learner's sake for finding time to be here uh, rather than in your sitting room following proceedings <laughs> at the tribunal. Right. And I want thank to thank you. you, Prof, for always bringing that education, that that uh, exposition around how uh, the law practice should be as a professional uh, in legal jurisprudence yourself. Thank you for finding time to be here. Uh, we, are, we are always indebted to the, the, your vast, uh, I mean, your, your knowledge and, 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 and the time you bring. Uh, to provide an education on our program. We would take a short break at this point and bring you newspaper review. Please stay with us.